good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is uh, Gabor Tozer. We are waiting yes. for a few more folks to join and we will uh, begin shortly. Um, Alexandra, can we, uh, should we uh, get started? Yes, thank you, Gabor. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you for joining us today for the How to Improve Demand Forecasting Accuracy in Retail webinar. Uh, I am Alexandra Kuhn. I will be the host for today's webinar. Uh, so let's start. Okay, please note that all of the contents of this presentation are the intellectual property of Quickburn Consulting. Uh, it will be uploaded uh, on our website later during this week. So you will be able to check it or rewatch it if you would like to. Uh, let's talk about the agenda of today's webinar. First, we are going to start with a speaker introduction, uh, then follow it up with context and background and uh, about what is forecasting. Then we will continue with what is what data is needed and how is data quality checked. Then continue with what methods are used, how can accuracy of forecast be measured, and what are the options for adjustments. And finally, we will uh, end it with next steps. So let's start. Our first speaker today will be Ms. Angela Chen. She is a senior expert and leader in retail process design, service, and solution architecture with over 10 years of experience in international retail transformation projects, both in the merchandising and planning domain of retail operations. Her experience includes worldwide retail organizations such as Auchan, Kohl's, Galerie Lafayette, Kirklands, and Adeo. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Our second speaker for today will be Mr. Tibor Kovac. He is a senior retail planning technology expert. His experience includes working with worldwide retail organizations such as Peak and Kloppenburg, Galerie Lafayette, Brown Thomas Arnott's, and Kirkland's. He has implemented a large number of planning and optimization solutions for retailers in his career, including demand forecasting based on Oracle technology. And our third speaker for today uh, is Mr. Gabor Tuzier. He is the Managing Director for Consulting Services Delivery. His background in retail started at Retech in the late 90s as a solution architect, followed by over 20 years consulting experience in retail. His experience includes worldwide retail organizations such as Auchan, Galerie Lafayette, Brown Thomas Arnott, and Kirkland. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to give you a quick uh, brief intro about our company as well. Um, thank you for the uh, introductions, Alexandra. So Quickborn um, is a group of professionals um, based uh, predominantly in Europe and North America, um, but uh, delivering our consulting services and expertise uh, around the globe. Um, and uh, uh, as you can see, we have been uh, uh, delivering uh, consulting services since 2003 and uh, uh, consisting of a team of over 100 uh, consultants uh, worldwide. We have 12 offices in nine countries and our entire practice is 100% purely focused on retail business. Um, we cover uh, business process consulting, strategy consulting, uh, but also uh, provide um, implementation and integration services on the uh, technology side. From a retail business vertical perspective or business segment perspective, we work with uh, uh, fashion, grocery, and uh, specialty retailers alike, such as uh, electronics or uh, home decor. And as I mentioned, we, we, we cover a, a global geography in terms of our delivery domain. Thank you. 
uh, about today's webinar um, and our intended audience. Uh, every person with basic understanding of retail business context and processes, planners, merchandisers, controllers, finance and finance department and supply chain specialists. Uh, at the end of uh, the webinar, you will have an overall understanding of forecasting and its retail environment context. You will gain a complete comprehension of what forecasting is in retail, what data is needed for accurate forecasts, and how to measure and ensure quality of both input data and generated forecasts. I would like to ask you uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please uh, send them through the group chat. We will answer questions at the end of each section. Thank you. And I would like to ask Angela to continue with her presentation. Thank you, Alexandra. To start the webinar, I'd like to start with what is forecasting? Forecasting means estimating product demand for a defined time frame. A good forecast depends on on-point analysis of the past and accurate prediction of the future. Forecast is a crucial factor for retailers to make informed strategic decisions and to achieve outstanding business performance. Why so? To understand this, let's take a look at the challenges that most retailers are facing nowadays. A recent Deloitte study shows that over two-thirds of U.S. adult shoppers express price, product, and convenience as their top three expectations. In the beginning of this year, growth for 2020 is already predicted to be slower than 2019 due to weak wage rise, slow disposable income growth, and risk of business holding back on investing and hiring due to trade tension escalation. The reality is worse than what was imagined. According to the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, consumer spending growth in January was 0.44%, in February 0.2%, and in March negative 7.5%. In April, the unemployment rate in the U.S. reached 14.7%, meaning more than 20 million people have lost their jobs. Due to this great financial uncertainty, consumer demand becomes increasingly volatile and price remains an important factor in terms of consumer spending decisions. Retailers not only need to employ the right strategies to stay cost effective, but also need to review their product offers and estimate what makes sense to invest in profitability wise. Next, we're going to talk about convenience. Convenience is not just about free or fast shipping. Convenience means a seamless consumer experience delivered with speed and value. We all know how frustrating it is to find an ideal product after endless research and then realize that it is out, out of stock. The ultimate goal of successful supply chain, get the right product to the right place at the right time, is actually not that easy to achieve. In addition to these consumer expectations, the overall environment is also a challenge. Retailers have been struggling with exponential technology disruptions, increasing marketing share volatility, and now on top of all this, a great deal of uncertainty caused by the COVID pandemic. More than ever as retailers, we need a game plan that supports us to make informed business decisions and to promptly adapt to the constantly evolving consumer demand and ecosystem. To be able to build this game plan, forecast is the first step. In this slide, I'm going to explain how forecast supports different strategic decisions within a retail organization. At the highest level, forecast can be used as a reference in financial planning to define the overall sales target and corresponding inventory investment budget. Demand forecast helps a business to make justified estimation of a realistic goal. 
Under this framework, the business then moves on to assortment planning, where assorted products are selected with sales and inventory objectives attached to each one of them. In other words, in this step, the business decides the combination and weight of products that will bring in the most profit. And these products are where the resources will be invested in. Once the product offer has been concluded, it's time to schedule the logistics. Based on the demand forecast and inventory strategy, the allocation and replenishment system can calculate when to deliver which product in which quantity to which location. An accurate forecast combined with an intelligent supply chain solution can efficiently reduce the need for safety stock and to avoid stock out situations. Remember that making sure the first choice products are always available also allow you to meet consumers' expectations of convenience. Get the right product to the right place at the right time cannot be achieved without an accurate forecast. Lastly, during and after the season, forecast can be compared with actual sales to define promotion and markdown efficiency. Learned lessons can then be used to adjust forecast methods and parameters in order to improve accuracy for the future. In summary, an accurate forecast provides the essential visibility and capability to build an optimal sales and inventory strategy. It also improves the sell-through rate and increases overall margin. When quantity and timing of inventory are perfectly aligned with sales and production capacity, retailers won't have massive unsold inventory anymore. This avoids promotion and markdown expenses and inventory write-off, which often lead to serious cost implications. As a side note, according to one study, non-grocery retailers in the U.S. lost $300 billion in revenues due to markdowns in 2018, which is equivalent to 12% of total sales. And inventory misjudgments was one of the biggest reasons for the markdowns. Next, let's look at a concrete example. In this example, I'm planning the subclass silk scarf for 2024 winter season. My total forecasted sales is 100,000 units, so I set my total sales target to the same. Among the possible items, I pick two, I pick two for my assortment. One is black and one is leopard and I distribute the total sales unit in a six to four ratio, because according to the forecast, my margin will be maximized when the assortment is constructed this way. The 60,000 and 40,000 units are further distributed to the stores according to the forecasted demand of each location. Next, taken into account the demand forecast for all stores combined, lead time, pack size, minimum, minimum order quantity, and store receiving days, my replenishment system suggests me to order 20,000 units of black scarves and 10,000 units of leopard on August 6th for preparing the season lounge on October 1st. In season order suggestions will be made by the system later on. At the end of the season, I observe a lot of leftover stock of the leopard scarf. After analysis, I found out that it's because consumers are less sensitive to price cut on this item than what uh, I originally assumed. Therefore, I adjust the estimated sales uplift in my forecast parameter for the next season. Any questions? Thank you, Angela. We do not have questions so far okay uh, let's go to the let's go to the next slide then thank you alexandra after explaining what forecast is and how it can be used in retail let's explore which data is necessary to generate forecast the mandatory input for generating forecast is historical sales for the past two to three years it would be ideal to separate regular promotion and clearance sales. If it's not possible, 
forecasts can still be generated, but with less accuracy. The more information we can load into the forecasting system, the merrier. For example, if the system knows past price change details, such as start and end dates, discount percent, or special events, it will be able to estimate the corresponding sales uplift and apply to future price change and events. It is also helpful to provide item life cycle and seasonal profiles so that the forecasting system can employ different strategies during different phases. When forecasting new items or new stores, the typical approach is to use a like item or a like store. A more elaborated approach would be to forecast based on item location attributes. For example, I have a new item, which is a red big neck t-shirt. Instead of using like item, I can combine the history of the color red, the style v-neck, and the item type t-shirt with a defined weight to generate a forecast for this new item. Store open and close dates allow the system to know when to start and stop forecasting sales for a given location. And exception indicators will let the system identify stock out situations or to exclude certain data points from the sales curve calculation. If we want to bring in even more information, we can look at customer segments and spending behavior analysis to forecast based on customer characteristics, decision tree, and purchasing patterns. Basket analysis enables our understanding of hollow and cannibalization effects and demand transference. And market and trend analysis provides the system with an additional insight of the future. Any questions so far? Yes, we have one question. Uh, what is the shortest data input that is allowed for a forecast to be accurate enough? For example, based on this example, forecasting would only be able to be done for core basic product, not fashion. If I understand correctly, the question says not fashion because it's assumed uh, the um, the person assumes that the fashion item doesn't have any history, is that correct? If we're talking about two to three years worth of data, a fashion yes. item wouldn't exist for two to three years long enough to get a historical data set. So uh -huh. your fashion inputs for a season might come in and out, you know, in a season. Yeah. Or might only right. last for a season. Mm -hmm. So that's why I so asked in what is the shortest amount of data that is allowed for a forecast to be accurate enough. Right. So in general, we would recommend two years of history. But mm -hmm. if the history is not uh, enough, then that's where the attributes would be useful. And also trend analysis is very important. Okay. So if you've got short history, you could use trend analysis to overlay with very little history and set your forecast to be very responsive in order to make up for that? Yes. Okay. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so back to you, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, we don't have any more questions. So I would like to ask Tibor to continue. And thank you, Angela, again. You're welcome, thank you. Um, sorry? Okay. We can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I need to restart. Uh, okay, so data quality is the cornerstone of reliable forecasts. When the fact data quality used for forecasting is good, it means half of the work is already done. So let's take a closer look at what defines data quality. The first one is data smoothness. One of the most important parts of the prediction is to identify the seasonal profile of our data. To do this, the data should be relatively smooth. As you could see in the diagrams, uh, the data is smoothed on the left-hand side. Therefore, seasons can be identified. And based on that, an exact seasonality profile can be created. When the data is highly random with huge spikes and plunges, it needs much more effort to produce seasonal profile. 
The next one is the data density. Uh, forecasting systems require an historical data input to produce accurate predictions. The necessary number of data points depends on several factors, but in general, more data points are better. With too few data points, forecasts will be inaccurate or cannot be created at all. Here, the diagram on the right side shows how challenging it is to create an accurate seasonality profile based on only a few data points. The breakfast risk to solve data density problem is to aggregate lower level data to a higher level and forecast on this high level. This approach can generate a quite accurate forecast if the lower level data points belonging to the same higher level behave similarly. For example, subclasses are grouped to classes. If the sales profile or lower level items are quite different, we could get two possible results. In case of normalized addition, the result will be inappropriate for any of the lower level items because that um, seasonality profile is absolutely not like any of the above ones. In case of a simple addition, the result will be relatively good for one of the items, stream so it's in this example, but absolutely wrong from the other. Okay, so a few words about the forecasting methods. There are plenty of forecasting methods available, and most of them have several variations and extensions. In this overview, we will list and discuss only the most recommendedly used and most popular data-driven methods. In addition to data-driven methods, traditional judgmental methods could still be useful in some particular cases, especially when there's no historical data available, such as a new store opening or a new item in the assortment. These methods are purely based on the judgment of expert employees individually or as a group. Keep in mind that forecasting is not a crystal ball. Forecasting tools provide data series, which are just mean values of an area where actual demand is extended, expected to be. Even in case of perf perfect forecast, it is highly possible that actual sale values will slightly differ. Okay, so the first method we wanna talk about is a simple regression. So simple dynamic regression methods are quite popular in forecasting. In case of non-seasonal data, these methods could give good trend identification and good forecast. In case of seasonal data, these methods could be useful to identify generic trends without seasonality or to provide seasonal forecast by using some extended techniques. Let's check the example on the diagram. It's based on a publicly available data set which contains 15 years of history of natural gas consumption and temperature in North Carolina. What can quickly be identified is that the gas consumption is lower when the outside temperature is higher. This is very straightforward. Where linear regression-based forecast can be useful is to estimate the precise gas consumption for a given temperature. For example, when the mean outside temperature is 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 26,222 million cubic feet gas consumption is expected. Regression methods use external variables to generate forecast. In case of an external shock, such as an economic crisis, these methods generate more reliable forecast because they leverage the correlation between external variables and the dependent variable, which is the forecast. In the same example of economic crisis, we could calculate estimated sales loss based on the unemployment rates or average customer income. Of course, every forecasting method has disadvantages. In case of regression methods, the handling of long-term forecasts could be quite complicated. For example, we could have a relatively good idea about the weather next week, but it's quite hard to predict the weather in 12 or 50 weeks. As the mean temperature cannot be predicted precisely, the gas consumption forecast will be much less accurate. Also, as the external variables are independent, this method is very sensitive to the correlation between the variables. Such correlations lead to higher volatility and thus less accurate forecasts. 
Decomposition of time series. Because of position methods, main idea is to identify and separate components of historical data, then reconstruct them with the appropriate projection into the future. The components are level, trend, and seasonality. It has two main steps. The first one is identification, which means separating the components using various mathematical methods. The second step is the prediction, which means combining the components with a projection into the future. So let's check the example. The level, trend, and seasonality components are separated in a data series. Based on the level and trend line, we could get the forecasted level and trend data. Then we need to apply the appropriate seasonality profile to these values to get the reconstructed forecast. On the diagram, the gray line is the historical data and the yellow line is the reconstructed forecast. The advantage of this method is the flexibility in choosing the best method to identify components. A lot of mathematical methods could be used for that. Now, the disadvantage is that overfitting and robustness significantly depend on modeling choice. I assume that we need some more explanations here. Overfitting means by creating an extremely complicated forecasting process, the result will fit almost perfectly to the historical data. But there's a risk that it, uh, it will only fit the history and will be unusable for creating accurate forecasts. Robustness, a forecasting model is robust when it works well outside the initial calibration data. A good, good example of this is a wet-if scenario. A robust forecasting process should provide accurate outcome in case of wet-if scenarios too, not only in case of the original data set. Okay, the next one is the autoregression. Autoregression methods are really popular for creating forecasts. These methods use the same historical data for forecasting and regression, so no external variables are involved as in case of simple regression. There are also a lot of extensions available which could provide better results in different cases. A simple autoregression method is exponential smoothing. That's a simple weighted moving average method where the third year's forecasted values are obtained by the weighted average of the two previous years in the identical period. In our example, this is a mass. The weight is a choice, but typically it decreases exponentially with data age. This method is robust and easy to implement. The problem that it lags behind trend and seasonality changes. In the diagram, you can see three years of historical data, that's the gray line, and two years of forecast, that's the orange line, starting from beginning of the third year of history. And the overall trend is in an augmenting fashion. Two important observations here. First, the method effectively smooths spikes of the historical data. The second observation is that the level of actual is higher than the forecast in the fourth year. This means that the forecast is lagging behind trend. An important expansion, an extension of exponential smoothing is the Holt Winters method which tracks level, trend, and seasonality separately. It had additional versions also, which can be chosen from to achieve the best fit for historical data with different behavior. It's reasonably easy to fit multiple complicated patterns, so it could be used to forecast really different data studies. The disadvantage is that batch parameter choices can lead to unstable results, especially in terms of seasonality parameters. For example, 11 months of, instead of 12 months um, of an item with yearly seasonality. Also, intermittent demand could result in getting no forecast at all. Our next methods, moving average methods. Moving average is a relatively complex model which could effectively applied when no or minimal trend could be identified in the historical data. The disadvantage is that uh, 
fitting to historical data is more complicated than in other methods. Fitting the historical data means, in case of every uh, forecasting method, to find the best parameter set. While several variations are available, there's a real Smith's Army knife that has been created. That's the ERIMA method. The acronym stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average, and the model does what the name suggests. It's a parameterized mix of the autoregression and moving average methods. In the first step, it identifies trends and seasonalities and separates them. In the second step, it performs a fit with moving average and autoregressive terms. The weight of them is defined by parameters. Based on the parameterization, it could be mathematically equivalent to several other popular methods. The biggest advantage of this method is the flexibility. Several methods could be implemented by changing the parameterization. However, this is the biggest disadvantage as well, since it's hard to select the appropriate model type without a huge effort of analysis. And last but not least, the AI-based methods. Another approach to get accurate forecast is to use artificial intelligence, more pre precisely neural networks, to predict values from historical data. The advantage of this approach is that it's very flexible. Based on the network structure, it could fit to any kind of process. It could provide more accurate results than any of the previously discussed methods when setup and training of the neural network is done appropriately. But the appropriate setup is also the source of its disadvantages. Selection of model setup is a very difficult question and there's no ideal answer. More complex setup always gives better results. Also, maintenance is hard. It's not easy to change or refit the model since it's quite complex to achieve extremely accurate results. The number of parameters could be a really huge, which could result in overfitting. In addition, robustness of these models can be questionable. So these are the commonly used forecasting methods nowadays in a nutshell. Thanks for your attention. And Alexandra, I'm just asking if we have some questions. Thank you so much, Tibor. Uh, no, we don't have any questions so far. Okay. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, just send them to the group chat. If not, then I would like to ask Gabor to continue. Oh, we have, sorry, we have uh, one question. Um, Lewandowski and AVG Graves, which modeling methods does it use? Anybody? Uh, to be honest, I cannot uh, answer that question at the moment. Uh, need to check. Sorry, that will need some time. Thank you. We will uh, come back to you with an answer if that's all right. Uh, thank you, Tibor. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, again. Thank you, Tibor, for the intro of methods. We'd like to continue by um, discussing a bit uh, about measuring results, which is, of course, a key factor in any forecasting exercise. Um, there is actually two um, phases of measuring results. Um, the most common one is the in-season measuring when you're actually comparing um, uh, fact data or historical data or actual data coming in from a forecasted period against the forecast to uh, validate that the forecast that was previously calculated is actually uh, comparable to the um, um, 
actual data you are seeing coming in in terms of demand. Um, so again, in a nutshell, it is a critical part of uh, um, uh, validating on a continuous basis that your forecasts have been uh, produced uh, in a way that they reflect reality. Um, and uh, all of these measurements uh, focus on the deviation between the, the forecast curve itself and actual data. One of the key concepts that's important to highlight here before we move on is that ideally demand forecasting is uh, focused on unconstrained demand. In reality, uh, when your actual sales data or performance data is coming in, um, whether you measured revenue or, or units or whatever you're tracking, um, could be different for a number of reasons. Not all of those necessarily reflect on the forecast itself um, being inaccurate, but we'll, we'll go into a bit more details in the next uh, slides um, about that. Um, and then again, the uh, subsequent steps uh, after measuring the accuracy of forecasts is stepping through a number of options on uh, whether the forecast needs to be adjusted, if it needs to be adjusted, and how. We'll talk about that um, on the next uh, slides. Um, what should happen when a generated forecast is different than actual data? And notice I didn't say wrong or inaccurate, but I said different, because there could be a number of reasons for that. Um, again, to answer this question, it's important to define what different means. Uh, and that could be different for uh, uh, different types of businesses or di even different retailers. Um, but essentially different here means some kind of calculated deviation between actual data and forecast data uh, for the same uh, time period and um, location and geography. Uh, when you are looking at deviation between forecast and actual data, you're measuring um, the difference between what has been forecasted and what your actual data is and comparing that difference then to a tolerance. Tolerance is a value that the business, again, needs to identify and, and uh, define um, based on the impact of a deviation between forecast and actual data and its impact on the business. In a nutshell, how big of a difference between my forecast and actual data do I need to get to start worrying about it? Well, again, this is different per, from business to business, from subclass to subclass, even between geographies. Uh, potentially even between time periods um, and needs to be defined by the business. Um, again, in a nutshell, uh, its definition should be based on the impact that difference has on business results. Sometimes a very small uh, deviation leads to a big impact on the business. Therefore, the tolerance for that needs to be set to a small value and vice versa. Sometimes you don't really care if the forecast results are very different although I'm not sure what the practical example would be, but in that case, tolerance would be high. Um, and then um, uh, understanding where you have deviation and, and whether that surpassed your tolerance, uh, as a next step, it's extremely important to understand, to analyze and understand why there is a difference. And uh, based on that information and that understanding, you can then decide what corrective actions to take, if any. So stepping on to uh, the next uh, example here, looking specifically um, um, at examples, um, we could have a situation where we run a forecast, we identify seasonality, we have trend, we have level, we have a beautiful curve that tells me for the next 12 months what spring summer looks like for a subclass I am tracking. However, the season begins. It is now April, May, slowly getting on to June, and I realized that my actual sales are nowhere near where I was forecasting. They are less than what I was forecasted to perform. Next step, again, understanding why that is. I could, in this example, find out that there was a supply chain failure. For whatever reason, my trucks didn't get to my store. There was a stock out that was unplanned, right? And coming back to my earlier comment, forecasting systems are built to model unconstrained demand, which tells your business what's the optimum result I should be able to achieve selling a certain assortment in my geography and time frame and, and every other consideration I've had. All the challenges in real world 
come against that by constraining that demand by, for example, not having available stock, which then leads to a stock out. And in this scenario, there was nothing wrong with the forecast, don't change it, right? You can adjust your expectations, of course, you can go back to financial plans and make in-season adjustments to reflect the new reality you're in. Nevertheless, the original forecast was actually uh, probably accurate, but again, your real sales are different because of uh, reasons outside of the unconstrained world in the very real constrained world that we live in. So this is just one, one example of a stock out driving such a scenario. Uh, next example is all about sporadic historical data. There's actually a couple of ways to deal with this, uh, but to give you a quick example, there are some items that sell seldom or at a very, very low quantity. Um, in other words, in a way where you don't have enough sales events in the past to fit a curve against it. Uh, there is a couple of approaches you can make in this case. The simpler approach is to say, what's the business value of forecasting this trend? Uh, it doesn't really have a trend. I can say I sold in this particular example, one, two, three items in 12 months. I will just order three, simplified example, but it serves the purpose. I just order three, I will have it in my warehouse. I supply it to my stores to avoid a stock out and hopefully they'll run out at the end of the season. During the season, uh, if there is a need, I can monitor my stock availability and stock on any of my stores and rebalance stock on an ongoing basis. That's an option. But I wouldn't necessarily go into a lot of um, investment in forecasting something that has a curve like this on the actual data. So that's one approach in this particular scenario. Another possibility, oops, sorry, let me go back one page there. That one. Another possibility is again, similar uh, example, similar graphs. Uh, however, I could say if I'm looking at a specific data point, which is uh, sparse, I could go higher level in the hierarchy. In this example, this is let's say swimsuit. I could go in, instead of using subclass, I could go up to class or even department or even higher on the merchandise hierarchy level and look at the higher level aggregated total sales and check if that data is dense enough to produce a curve. And then take that curve at whatever level I got to enough data points where I had a curve and transpose that back down to the low level demand that my original uh, subclass item that I was trying to forecast had, which will produce uh, a curve how meaningful that is, is I think still <laughs> potentially questionable, but this is another method where forecasting systems that had difficulty dealing with this sparse data scenario were forced to produce an answer that again, in reality is probably less valuable or actionable, but you at least got a result. So also this approach could be automated by various tools um, to produce a, a forecast in, in such a uh, scenario. Um, another uh, possibility when I'm looking at historical data um, and I'm training my uh, uh, forecasting engine or, or even an AI engine to produce a forecast for me is incomplete historical data. Um, this can happen for a number of reasons, but uh, for a spring, summer historical season, I only have data for a particular item until wow. April and then nothing after that. Uh, it could be partial uh, months during the season in this example, it's only the first part. Um, in such a situation, um, automatic systems will have a difficult time forecasting this because they'll forecast a drop in demand. However, the break in my historical uh, sales volume isn't necessarily reflecting a drop in demand uh, when we look at an unconstrained world, but it could have been caused by a constraint. So in this case, uh, either manually or using automated solutions by attributes, for example, or even potentially various forms of clustering, you can look for like item. Uh, or if this is a store or a time period, you look for uh, like time periods or like uh, stores or geographical areas or clusters, demographics, whatever you're using to find similarly behaving products and take the uh, historical data and the forecast curve associated with those products and complete the uh, missing portion 
of your forecast that you have in this particular scenario. Um, it's, a, it's an approximation. It either requires manual input or, again, um, either machine learning or AI or deterministic systems uh, to find uh, similarly behaving um, items in your merchandise or, or data elements in your merchandise to, to um, uh, complement your, your data set and produce a full season uh, curve. Um, something else that can happen, again, constraint world, another example, this is about locations. You could have an unexpected store closure that uh, none of the systems were aware of during uh, initial forecast generation. Um, in this case, um, it, is, um, um, it makes sense to correct uh, forecasts down. In this example, you have an unexpected store closure for one of the stores starting in June. So all your sales in the physical location will go to zero because the store is being remodeled or has been destroyed in the fire or whatever happened. Um, and you need to be able to then analyze the impact across the enterprise and make a decision on whether you rebalance stock if you still have the stock from the store or if you would like to still recover the total enterprise um, uh, objectives for the year, you can calculate how much you need to uplift sales in other locations to recover this drop in this particular uh, location. So in this case, you can manually adjust the uh, forecast curve. And uh, again, um, that's uh, something that systems typically and, and models allow you to do. Um, sorry. Again, a little bit of a jump forward here. Time shift is another scenario where manual adjustments or adjustments that are made by uh, uh, systems observing such a requirement uh, need to be made. In this particular example, we have used Easter. Easter is a holiday that has a potential uplift depending on what you're selling. And uh, when you're looking at the Gregorian calendar, Easter can happen year to year in different months. Sometimes it's in March, sometimes it's in April. It's very important when you look at historical data and produce a forecast based on that historical data where Easter was in April and your forecast uh, is reflecting an up for April, but you know this year Easter is in March, that you shift that forecast peak to March with the rest of the curve uh, because it will be an earlier impact. Um, again, some systems can auto detect such scenarios. Uh, or you can manually make this adjustment if you are aware of it, because again, historical data may not reflect that necessarily. Um, other adjustments can be made as well. As you get into season, again, your actual data starts coming in, you will be able to observe if it's anywhere near where your forecast curves were. One of the situations that could happen is that your curve shape is okay, but the level is incorrect. In this example, the blue line shows that your actual sales were far below your forecasted sales, which were the red curve. And in this case, again, you have the option of adjusting down the level of your forecast to give you a revised forecast going forward based on your lower than expected uh, volume going in. Remember what I said at the beginning of this section about checking why your actual numbers are below. If this is due to a constraint, you may need to uh, weigh the pros and cons of adjusting the demand curve because again, a demand curve is typically unconstrained, ideally. If this was not caused by a stock out, this is an actual demand, then it makes sense to adjust the curve down and again, be able to calculate its impact across the enterprise on this particular item, location, et cetera, and make necessary um, adjustments in, um, in the business. Finally, there is an example here about a scenario where we are in the season, we are looking at data coming in. That's the actual curve on the right-hand side. Uh, and compared with that, my original forecast is kind of similar, but not really close. And there are scenarios and situations where it's not enough to take an existing forecast and shift it or uh, change its level but I really need to go back to step zero and rerun the forecast from scratch and choose a new forecasting method that matches more closely what my actual sales uh, are looking like. Again, assuming that's an unconstrained sales uh, result from, from my actual data. Um, and then again, calculate its impact and um, uh, what I need to do in the business to, uh, to recover. 
So before we go to next steps, uh, this is what we had in terms of uh, measuring accuracy, tracking your forecasts and making adjustments with some examples. Does anyone have any questions so far? Uh, yes, we have one question in the group chat. Uh, that is, what is the international benchmark for forecast tolerance? Um, what is acceptable? So that, interestingly enough, is not a single figure. It really depends on uh, whether somebody is, if you just look at retail, right? Uh, and for, you know, forget other forecasting applications like weather forecasting. If you look at retail alone, there's very different tolerance figures between grocery, which is fairly constant supply, versus fashion, which is extremely seasonal and volatile, potentially, and has, has major impacting, uh, contributing factors to its performance, including weather. Um, you know, spring, summer season, how quickly did winter end? When did the, you know, the nice weather begin? Did people start buying summer clothes, or was it snowing in May? Uh, um, there is a higher degree of volatility typically in, in fashion and seasonal items. Uh, because of this, um, benchmark figures uh, for tolerance are different between types of retail and also geography. Um, interestingly enough, we have looked at a couple of uh, comparisons between various segments and various types of businesses in terms of how they have themselves rated their forecast accuracy in the past. So maybe it's not a perfect comparison or, or, or a reference figure, um, but interestingly enough, uh, one coherent answer in, in this area from all of these businesses was that they felt that their forecasting uh, capabilities have improved due to technology, understanding, investment, et cetera. However, they perceive their environment to become more volatile over time due to political geography and climate factors, interestingly enough over time comparing with 80s, 90s versus the 2000s and today. Um, so is there international benchmark? Um, I'm not aware of one. We will research that topic. Uh, there have been studies that have been done across the board in various geographies and have made those general observations about tolerance. Um, it is different per segment and that it's been, it's been to some degree increasing because even though forecast accuracy has grown, the external factors seem to become more volatile recently uh, in every sense. I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, just a few words about the first question I got about the Lewandowski and uh, the ABC graves. Uh, these are both extensions of the exponential and smoothing method. Okay, Lewandowski is an adaptive version of the Alt Winters method we did talk about. Um, a bit less work and knowledge required to apply it. That's the most important benefit of it. And the other one is an adaptive variable smoothing method, which is quite useful in detecting trends and filtering spikes out. Um, yep, thank you. Thank you, Tibor. Um, I hope that answer okay. was, was sufficient, but uh, by all means, uh, if, if anybody has any additional questions, you know, by all means, uh, we will share contact details and, and uh, feel free to submit any follow-up questions even after uh, the um, webinar. Um, going on to uh, next uh, steps, uh, we often get questions about uh, you know, topics like forecasting, you know, this is great, uh, how can I apply it to my business? Um, especially in retail, and retail has seen a fair share of challenges recently, like most of the world, but in retail, I think it's, it's been hitting the hardest. So in terms of um, options for forecasting, we have generally seen three different directions that have been taken by retailers. Some have gone down a road of building their own data science team, department, and essentially run 
a forecasting unit, um, including many other data science responsibilities within the organization themselves. This is something that can be quite difficult and challenging for two simple reasons. We live in the world of data. Everybody out there, not just retailers, but every business out there wants data insights and the, the demand for data scientists is extremely high. It's very difficult to find good people, very difficult to, uh, to fund uh, the starting of such departments because it's expensive to build such teams, especially, um, especially now. Um, second option uh, is uh, certainly uh, purchasing some kind of a solution online or on-prem, that's, uh, that's uh, just a detail. Uh, but purchasing and acquiring a solution that can uh, analyze historical data and with a certain amount of input and uh, uh, operational uh, maintenance, uh, provide a forecast that is uh, measurable and uh, through quality assurance, reliable to drive decision support in the business. This is a, also a common uh, path. Last but not least, and recently in an increasing share of the uh, market, if you will, more and more companies are looking to uh, a secure forecasting service from providers. That means companies share their historical data, uh, provide additional input when needed, and forecasting providers simply share back the forecast itself with varying degrees of um, input that uh, the retailer business itself can, can uh, um, make in that uh, process of generating those forecasts. And a lot of these services also provide, of course, on an ongoing basis, uh, review, QA, tolerance, checking, and correcting um, of these forecasted um, uh, demand curves. Um, that's where we see um, most retailers going at the moment. Um, what is 100% sure is that everybody out there who doesn't have forecasting capability in its business now, regardless of its size, is incorporating that. And even bigger companies are reviewing what they have. And that uh, concludes uh, our presentation. Here is our contact information. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to us, raise any additional questions. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in our next webinar that we'll announce shortly. The recording will be uploaded as well to our website and you will be able to download uh, both the presentation and the recording as well. Thank you everybody for attending the webinar. We hope you enjoyed it.